Welcome everybody to the first episode of Sultans of Slack. Today we have a really awesome episode for you guys, but since it's our very first episode, we'd like to take the time to introduce ourselves and talk to you about some of the things you might expect while listening to our podcast. The Sultans of Slack podcast is hosted by Andy, Danny, and myself. My name is Tim. Andy and I are cousins and we've always sort of dabbled in media doing things just for our pure enjoyment, making small music videos or making songs or being involved in community projects. And on the back burner, we've sort of always had this idea of doing a podcast. But it really wasn't until we met Danny while we were hosting some Twitter spaces that it kind of pushed us over the edge and put us in the right direction to start something like our own podcast. And the final member of our team is our producer, Jake, who's actually another cousin of ours. And we knew we would need a really talented audio engineer when it came to helping us make this podcast work. Through a lot of projects that we were involved in, we found ourselves sort of interviewing a lot of different super interesting people, whether it was people that were involved in art or music or like other Web3 projects. And that's sort of when we decided that learning people's stories was really the way that we wanted to go with our podcast. And we really hope that you guys enjoy listening to that. This kind of brings us to our first guest, um, Courtney Earhart, who's a very dear friend of ours, and she, in a lot of ways, is the person that made this podcast possible. She's the community manager over at the Death Bats Club project, and she's actually worked for the band Avenged Sevenfold for several years now. Big thank you to you, Court, for being here today. We're super excited to have you. And I actually want to start off by having you give us a little bit of your backstory. I started a news website called Deathbed News in 2007 because I felt that there wasn't there wasn't an easy way for people to get news on the band. And I just wanted people to have that. So a friend of mine and I started Deathbed News. She was along with me for about a year, a year and a half or so. Then she kind of lost interest. So I took over the whole thing, did that for seven years. And over the course of the years, their management company had taken notice of the website. Their record label had taken notice of the, the website And every now and then, we'd kind of work back and forth together a little bit. I then decided to close the website in 2014. I believe it was on the day that the website turned seven. And a few weeks after that, I got a phone call from M Shadows, and he invited me to become a official part of their team, which I absolutely jumped at. And from there, it's been eight years. It was eight years this December. And that's how I started with them. Death Bats Club, I'm not sure if they had a plan for me to be the project manager at the beginning of it, but it just kind of grew in the way that we all know. And eventually, right before it launched and opened up to everybody, they asked me to be the project manager. And here I am. Had you talked to M Shadows before he called you? Yeah. I had become acquainted with them through Deathbat News when Nightmare was released. They flew me out to California to hear the album. And mm. that was pretty wild. That I remember I was originally supposed to go to Warner Brothers and listen to the full album and review it. They weren't sending the album out to a lot of people to review at that point because of the circumstances. So I was going to review it at Warner Brothers. And Zaki was like, well, we can't just fly her out and have her go to the record label and sit at a record label all day. And then she's gone. So those plans kind of changed. What I ended up actually doing was... I ended up at Zachy's house that morning and he played me some of the album in his home studio. So he and I sat in there and listened to some of the album. From there, I went to Warner Brothers, walked around, met a few people on their team, listened to a little bit of the album there. Then I ended up at their management company, 
listened to a little bit of the album there. And from there, I ended up at Matt's house. And that was completely, that was not something that was originally going to happen. But the day just worked out that way. I ended up at his house. He played me the Nightmare demo in his home studio. And we just hung out a little bit after that. Oh my gosh. that's Was that like a, that sounds like a real cornerstone sort of weekend for you, especially because you being passionate about the band and having to put all that work into it just for the heck of it, that must have felt like it really paid off when you got to that point. Yeah, it was incredible. I really enjoyed doing Deathbed News. And I always told myself when I stop enjoying it and it becomes more like just something I feel like I have to do, then I'm going to end it. And eventually it did get to that point. But I, I really enjoyed it. I fought with myself for probably six months to a year about closing it down. But it just felt like the right thing to do at the time when I when I did decide to do it. But to go back, I was acquainted with them. So I had talked to them a bit here and there, you know, saw them at shows here and there. But yeah, it, it, it's been pretty wild. It's still very much so a pinch me type thing where I'll be in situations and I'm like this can't be real like I'm working with you know my my favorite band but it's been incredible Mm. so let me let me ask you a question that I haven't ever asked you Courtney and now that the death bat news thing is kind of in the past maybe you can maybe you can release a little where were you getting your information that you you were the first to release information but can can you release how you were getting your information for the site to take off Yeah, so I would set up Google alerts for each band member's name and news would come through and I I would click through. And if I thought it was something, you know, interesting to share, then I would post it. I got really, really good at searching for things on Google. Probably a little bit too good. (laughs) But yeah, it, it was mostly just Google alerts and knowing the right types of things to search for. I had like a spreadsheet of every single rock radio station in the world that I could find. Not just the US, but ones overseas. And when they would go on tour, I would go to those websites and see if the websites posted photos or interviews, any sort of content on the concerts, and I would post it. So it was... It was a lot of work, but it was a lot of fun. The community that I built through that, you know, I know many people from Deathbat News now that are now in Deathbats Club, and it's been fantastic getting to know them on a much more personal level rather than just a name that comments on the website. But yeah, I, I just got the news from from the internet. <laughs> So you became like a central hub to kind of bring everybody together as as like one big community. Right. Rather than separate communities that something's happening, say, in Seattle that may, maybe somebody in Miami doesn't know about. They can go to Death Bat News and kind of see what's happening all together as one community. Yeah. And that's what the band really, really liked about the website is that it was a place that all Avenged Sunfold fans could go to and chat and get news and for somebody like me I love that kind of stuff I don't like going from Twitter to Instagram to Facebook to read news I like going to one central place so it was really fun for me to give that to Avenged Sevenfold fans I I assume most of the listeners that, that will have listening to this first episode, probably know who you are. But now that we got some of that out of the way, the reason that we chose you for the first episode, to me, that was a natural thing. That's what we all really wanted. And it's because of the relationship that we built, um, I don't know, over what, the past year now? So Tim and I had talked a while back, a couple of years going probably about doing a podcast. This is before we are into crypto or NFTs or anything. Just never felt right. We decided to take a plunge into the Twitter space type thing. Um, and most of that was just wanting to get to know the community because we were such big events, some full fans ourselves that we kind of wanted to get to know people. The reason that I felt like it was important to have you on our first episode was because those Twitter spaces were kind of the catalyst 
for what we're doing now with this podcast. And if it wasn't for a lot of the work you did in the community with, with the Death Bats Club and a lot of the support that you offered us, I don't think that this ever would have became a thing. So it's a big thank you, a huge thank you. And it's also just, it felt natural for me to be like, Courtney's our first, got to be our first guest. Mm -hmm. Thank you guys for having me. I'm very honored to be on your podcast. And uh, yeah, it's incredible. I mean, we've made some lifetime memories just in the past year alone. Mm -hmm. For sure. And now that we've buttered you up, uh, <laughs> win album. <laughs> I don't know. I'm I'm waiting on it just like you guys. Oh man. Mm, that's right. not well, a good that answer. concludes that concludes our podcast. No, I'm just kidding. <laughs> it is kind of funny though, you know, I can remember going to Death Bad News all the time too, because it was like social media was like just getting started and you know, now that's kind of how we all get our news. But you were just rarely getting those little morsels of news and for like a teenager, you know, I was a teenager at the time, that was like all I wanted to do was hyperfixate on my favorite band and figure out what they were up to. I mean, like you've had a really big influence on building this community. And it's really interesting because like we've all been able to network together. People that just we would never, never had the opportunity to, to like meet and stuff before. How do you see the landscape changing from now going forward, especially because they're about to go on tour and stuff? Well, I definitely think that the community is much more put together now. You know, you would have your people on, you know, if we talk about now, currently, you have your fans on Twitter, you have your fans on Instagram, you have your fans on Facebook, and you can't expect that each one of those fans has an account on each one of those social media sites. That's where I think Discord is a great thing, but I feel like the community that we have built will only get bigger and better going forward. I think what we have now is just really great. We have a bunch of great people, they're welcoming, and I see new people in there every day who are commenting on how welcoming everything is. And I think as we move forward, and whether or not they become a Death Bats Club holder or not, I just see it being a hub and just helping the community more than anything. And that's something that gets brought up even on Twitter a lot is, hey, hop over to the Discord. There's so many helpful people. It's not just one person that you have to look for. You know, there's a, there's announcements that people can reference to. There's just the, the general chat. Anytime somebody has a question, there's like 100 people in there trying to help them out. Well, yeah, and, like, you can't really have conversations on Twitter. Right. You know, it's just, like, you leave a comment and then you you might, like, comment back every now and then, but you can't have a really good conversation. It's a good place for everybody to just get in and hang out. Like, you know, and you'll see people – we talked about this last weekend – You'll see people in there that are, you know, I need a break from Discord because maybe my mental health is suffering or anything like that. But I kind of look at it as a different thing because I enjoy the community aspect and I'm sure, you know, y'all do as well. You know, you always want to limit yourself just being on a computer in general. This is why we do things like the, the distance challenge and things like that. But I go in there and like it's always positive you know if something hasn't really gone right with the day i can go in there and just nine times out of ten have a great conversation about things that you know other people enjoy along with me it tends to just be a real positive thing yeah it's a really great place to go i agree it is very positive and i understand that you know people have to take steps back every now and then i do you know sometimes i'm in there all day long and then sometimes I make a few comments in like two weeks. But it is very welcoming. It is very positive. For the most part. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah. I mean, there's always going to be times like that. But the community the community normally steps up. and We can edit that out. I just have to be an idiot once in a while. <laughs> no, that, that was funny. That was funny. But all right. We've talked about a lot of this. You know, we've had Twitter spaces and things where we've talked about all that kind of stuff already. I'm interested in. Courtney, that's kind of caught my eye from some things that you do is your photography. Now, I've been I've been lucky enough to attend, you know, a big time concert with you and uh, have seen some of the shots that you get from things like that. Is that something that you look forward to doing is like 
maybe a side hustle or a main hustle in the future? Or do you have any plans to, to do anything like that? Cause I mean, you get some really, really good pictures from these things. Yeah. So I love concert photography. I started doing it when I was in my teens. We had a little local venue that would have like hardcore shows and metal shows and all kinds of shows. Contrary to popular belief, I do like a little bit of rock, but my rock is more warped to a rock than anything. But yeah, I would be there three, four times a week and I would just bring my camera and I would go and take pictures and eventually I just really, really enjoyed doing it. I think the reason is because it was really fun capturing people doing something that they love to do and I'd go, I'd take the pictures, I'd, you know, throw them up on Flickr. I remember that. Yeah, I, I'd put them up on Flickr and, you know, sometimes bands would take notice, sometimes they wouldn't, you know, that that's not at all why I was doing it. But then I kind of started to, I got a better camera and then graduated to requesting actual photo passes because at this venue you didn't need one it was you know maybe fit a few hundred people if you crammed everybody in there I don't even think you could fit that many people but I would request photo passes you know Avenged were probably my first big show that I photographed and that was in large part because of Death Bat News because at that point you know I had become friendly with people at their record label who I still call friends today I had become friendly with management so it was really easy to request a photo pass and that just was on such another level and it was so much fun so that's definitely something that I enjoy doing I haven't done it in a very long time for anybody that isn't avenged yeah it's something I love doing it's something that I I really want to get into doing more of There are shows where I don't have a photo pass, but I have a a very nice point and shoot camera that I'll take. And as long as I'm close enough to the stage, I can get, you know, almost professional quality shots. But yeah, just really fun to do, really fun to share. And it's really nice to make those memories and have those memories in such great photos. So how does one obtain said photo pass and and if, and if one does is he required to take photos or he more just hang out yeah no so you go through usually in the way that i've always had to do it is you go through their management company yes you do have to take photos and many of the times you only get the first three songs i'm all right i've taken notes <laughs> And depending, sometimes they want the photos. Oh, yeah. So sometimes you have to sign something that says that the artist then owns the photos that you take and you'll send them over to the management company and, you know, they can use those for promo and things like that. Oh, that's crazy. Jokes aside, that's pretty interesting. I've never had to do it. There was a little point in time where... I did um, a festival down here called Voodoo Festival, and the local radio station, I just wrote to them saying, hey guys, I'd love to shoot some photos for you because the photos that are on your website are terrible. (laughs) And they were like, yeah, sure. You know, like I sent them (laughs) samples and stuff like that. And they were like, yeah, sure. We'll, we'll give you a VIP pass to Voodoo Fest. And this was like a $500 wristband. Damn. And, you know, we only need you to shoot for this artist. And it was Eminem. Oh, whoa. It had rained all day long. And then they tell me, like, I go to pick it up, I think maybe the day before. And they're like, well, you don't get, like, pit access. You have to shoot from the crowd. And I was like, uh, I'm five foot tall. (laughs) Like, I'm not, I'm just going to get people's heads. So I did the best that I could. They didn't mind the photos. I ended up shooting for Miley Cyrus for them as well. Wow. For that show, it was front of the house. So I was like all the way to the back of the floor at the front of the house. And I don't have like this big, powerful lens or anything like that. It was, I hadn't really gotten into it that much at that point. 
So I did that. I guess they were fine with the photos. And then the last show that I did for them was Jay-Z. And that one I had like at the stage. So I got some pretty good, uh, pretty good photos from that. How am I just barely learning this about you? That's that's awesome. I, yeah, I know. This is why we do the podcast. Too bad you didn't know Tim then. You could have sat on his shoulders. I was just thinking that. I was just going to say that. They also sent me to a water park to shoot for a good Charlotte at the time. I had to drive through what felt like a hurricane to get there. You know, rain so bad that you can't see the front of your car. Mm-hmm. And I was so worried that I was going to be late. And then I got there and they're like, oh, we don't have you down for anything. And I'm just like, I did not just drive 45 minutes to be told that I don't I don't have anything. That went fine. And then they put me on a float with Benji and Joel for Mardi Gras. So I got some photos of that for them and that was it. Courtney, that's crazy. How do we not know about this stuff? Courtney, you're like mad famous. Not at all. Was it hard to throw candy with one hand and shoot the parade with the other? We don't throw any candy during Mardi Gras, but... Courtney was throwing beads. Courtney wanted a show. Yeah, I was just going to say. Yeah. I didn't throw anything. I was I was just kind of hanging out and taking a few pictures. So is this is something that you do want to like start your own thing or maybe branch out into other things as well and kind of bring it all under an umbrella or is it just going to, you know, kind of be concert photography by itself, standalone? Oh no, absolutely. I'd love to, to have it all be under one thing when I think of what that thing is finally going to be, but I would love to get more into it. Obviously not really much went on for the past Well, the past year was fine, but the two years before that, nothing was happening. Mm -hmm. But going to a few shows this year and finally getting a chance to pull out a camera again and and take photos, it just kind of reinvigorated my love for concert photography. And I definitely want to get more involved in it again. It's going to be dope. I have a feeling like this is going to be the year for you to really like brush back up on it and re-familiarize yourself get back into it a little bit hopefully this is gonna be this is gonna be a very busy year i think just a feeling though (laughs) yeah it's just a feeling i mean just a feeling we're not digging for alpha or anything but well i mean two huge festivals have already been announced Mm -hmm. so and i'm not even just talking about like avenge i'm talking about it seems to me like there's rumblings like lots of people are going to start getting back out there and obviously you know we've been to vegas and we watch katie perry and you got some awesome pictures from that one like there's there's going to be a lot of things to do and you know i'm, I'm looking forward to seeing what you come up with yeah. yeah hopefully i'm back in vegas taking more really good photos at that show yeah can we talk for a second about how awesome the get togethers are though for the dbc stuff they're fantastic like they're incredible i have so much fun at those things I do have one piece of beef, though. No. What's that? What's your beef? About the Huntington Beach um, get together. <laughs> <laughs> it's it's actually just a really funny thought that I had, but we were getting towards the end of the party, and I think they had some giveaways and stuff to do. But what I <laughs> heard was that there was not a microphone, and I'm like, I'm like, wait, whoa, 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 wait a minute. Yes. <laughs> this is a. <laughs> This is a platinum selling metal band yeah. and we're in, we are inside of, of their warehouse and you're telling me yeah, there's not a microphone? So <laughs> we could play Mortal Kombat in Contra, but <laughs> we couldn't. We had the speakers, but we did not have the microphone. Mm. I actually have no beef because I didn't care about that anyway. But I just, It was funny. I was laughed fun. when I like, I remember walking around, I was like, we should probably do the giveaways now because... You know, it's like mid party and people might be starting to leave and this and that. And they were like, yeah, we don't have a microphone, so we're going to have to pivot on that. And I was like, all right. (laughs) Dude, we got a Tim (laughs) Snort right there. I'm not editing that out. It is so funny, though. (laughs) It's just like, you know, that is the one place I would expect a microphone to be. I don't know, you know. Another fun thing that we've got to experience with Court is her love for sports. I want to talk about that a little bit because... Oh, for sure. Yes. 
we put on like a little bit of fantasy and stuff this year for fantasy football, but in doing so, we we learned that Court has a pretty deep knowledge of the sports <laughs> ball world. Yay, sports ball. Oh, well, where'd your love for sports come from? I grew up as a Miami Dolphins fan. I was a massive fan of Dan Marino. Yep. That got me into NFL football. I had the blanket. I had the starter jacket. I was a massive Dolphins fan. And then... Is that because all the Saints fans were wearing like brown bags on their heads at the time or what? Yeah, there there wasn't really much of uh, any cheering on the Saints. I've always been a Saints fan, but I, I don't know. I... I was just a Dolphins fan. I I love Dan Marino. I still think he's the best quarterback to never win a Super Bowl ring. But then I played cabbage ball in middle school. What is that? Yeah, what is cabbage ball? It's like a mix of like softball and dodgeball. Like, not really. It's it's like softball, but with a massive ball (laughs) that... You just throw and then you hit it with a bat and like like a four square ball, like one of those big rubber. No, it's not that big and it's like heavy. Hmm. It's like a it's like a head of cabbage. Yeah, kind of, sort of. It's about the size of a head of cabbage. I played that and then I got really into softball. And one of my dreams was to play softball in the Olympics. Obviously, that never happened. And then I got hurt playing softball one year and I I quit playing like in high school this was before high school I just played for like our town and it was like a it was a playoff game it was like one o'clock in the morning in this city where we didn't know where anything was and the I played left field because I had a really good arm you got to be fast to play left field too you got to be able to run yeah I I had a really good arm, and it was the first play of the game. The ball went into the hole between left and center. And you guys know how short I am. Our center fielder was like the height of a grown woman. And I dove for the ball. And it was one one of those plays that you dream of making. And you're like, oh, yeah, like this play could, you know, the photo of this play could be on the front of a newspaper, (laughs) dove for the ball. I called for it, hit my glove. And after that, I remember waking up laying on the field. So what happened is that the center fielder didn't hear me call for the ball. And it was like David running into Goliath. (laughs) And she knocked me out. So I came to on the field with like my coach and my mom running onto the field to make sure I was okay. I got up, walked to second base, walked it off, went and sat down. I was like, my shoulder's killing me. I was so mad because I ended up dropping the ball. So the out didn't count. And I was just like, seriously, all of that and the out doesn't even count. (laughs) I ended up with like spider fractures in my shoulder and a chipped tailbone, which I've done that. That's not fun at all. I remember like getting into the car and I told them, I was like, I can't sit down. Jeez. I can't. It hurts too bad. By the time I got to the hospital, I had kind of eased into it and I needed a police escort to the hospital because we didn't know where the hospital was. And it was so early in the morning. But yeah, that was, that was the last that I ever played. I went to high school to play softball and then I never did. Any other sports you get into big time, Courtney? You get into like the Olympics when they come around or anything like that? Oh, I love the Olympics when they come around. Take curling, for example. Nobody knows what curling is, but like (laughs) I become an expert on curling only during the Olympics. I love curling. I love it. I love curling, the bobsleds, gymnastics, swimming, skiing, like anything. I'm just like, this is so much fun to watch. And I think it's so big because you just have, like, you know who to cheer for. So you have so many people just rooting and cheering for, you know, your own country. It's just a lot of fun to watch. And, I mean, these people are the best of the best in their fields. So that's pretty fascinating to watch, too. Yeah, I think it's just fun to, like, come together and root for something. Yeah, that's true. 
the whole atmosphere of going to sporting events is just fun for me because the whole vibe is, it's just a fun vibe. We're all at odds with each other when like basketball season or football season's going on and stuff like that. But then when the Olympics roll around, we're all like, oh, well, Mike, Michael Phelps has more medals in their entire country. Those chumps. You know what I mean? Like we, <laughs> <laughs> it gives us all an opportunity to be like, oh, finally, we can all cheer for the same thing because we spent so much of the year cheering against each other. That's when like everything is right in the world mm. is just when the Olympics are on and taking over everything and everybody's going, you know, for their own country and whatnot. Yeah. Yeah. I was fortunate enough. I was in, it must've been the 2008 Olympics. I was in Brazil for that. Wow. And they are insane down there. And like every day we, I had some friends that were native Brazilian dudes and, and every day they would be like talking to me about the medal count. Right. And all this kind of stuff. And it's just like, and really the only thing they were winning at the time was like, I feel like they were competing in soccer and like maybe just a couple other, like they had some sprinters and stuff like that. They were doing pretty good, but it was one of those years that Michael Phelps was around and he was just thrashing everybody. And it was probably, it was really funny though, because like they were so cool about it. And so it is kind of a global thing. They were so cool about, they were like just teasing me about it and we were teasing each other about it. It was just like a, you know, Man, I do like the Olympics. I don't, I don't know. I'm, I've always questioned whether I've liked them. I guess I do, though. Yeah, I mean, like in recent Olympics with Katie Ledecky swimming, and then, you know, you're watching it live, and she's so much faster than everybody that nobody is even on the same screen anymore. Mm -hmm. Like, it's just her, and you don't even get, like, the little line where the next person is because the next person is not even in view. <laughs> so much fun to watch. Mm-hmm. Yeah, it's way fun when we're winning. <laughs> yeah, like you wake up and you're like, oh, how many gold medals do we have today? How many did we win overnight? And everybody becomes experts of these weird sports. Yeah, that's true. Everybody's like, well, his, look at his technique. Like, I know. <laughs> he's he's not sweeping as fast because he needs it to slow down to knock this down, like, out of the way. Yeah. <laughs> it's like, mm, look at his wrist movement. That's just not That's just not going to work. That's yeah, not gold medal he, material. He let that one out of his hand too quick. He, he should have held on for another five seconds. <laughs> yeah. All of a sudden, that's probably the part of the problem with the world right now is that we're all, all we're just all, all of a sudden experts, experts on everything. everything. Yeah. She cut, yeah. she cut too close to that fence. That's, mm. that, she's never going to make it. Yeah. Yeah. She spent too much time in the air on that. She, her time's going to be slow. So funny. It's like the bobsledding, you know, when you, or, or whatever, and you watch the downhill bobsledding and it's just like, mm, man, they took that corner way too bad. Look at that. Oh yeah. Right. <laughs> they, they went, yeah, they went way too high on that corner. Yeah. That's, that's not going to yeah, cut that's it. Not gonna, that's going to show up at the end. I promise you that much. <laughs> like we're there. I know, but it's it's crazy because it's like. Trust me, I I know. I've watched ten runs already. Yeah, like I <laughs> yeah. I know. I've I've watched this many. It, it's nuts because like it really does come down to like a freaking millisecond, and if you go like one inch higher yeah. than somebody else went on the wall, mm -hmm. or the or the um the, the one place I can never tell the difference is on the, when they do the rowing, right? I feel like the last couple Olympics, the rowing has gotten bigger, you know, and <laughs> and like I, I can't tell the difference between one team rowing versus the next one. The only way I can tell the difference is one of them is ahead of the other one. Like, you know what I mean? And then you're just like, oh, man. Yeah, they'll be behind. And then like you just see them like go back and then go forward and go back. And all of a sudden their little like boat just shoots out in front of the other one. I don't understand, but it's fun to watch. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Australia is so sloppy Ugh. with their technique. Jeez. Shouldn't they be better in the water? They're surrounded by it. <laughs> <laughs> Court, if there's one uh, sport that needs to be added to the Olympics, what is it? Dodgeball. Oh, dodgeball would be good. Maybe cabbage ball, whatever the hell that is. <laughs> Still trying to figure it out. It's like bag milk all over again. <laughs> Nobody's ever heard of it. The bag, yeah, I've never, yeah, cabbage ball, yeah, cabbage ball. Is that like a right. school sanctioned sport, or did some drunk guy just make that up? Because I've never heard of cabbage ball. It's like schools. It was all I played it like for school against other schools. No, you didn't. Maybe it's just a Catholic oh school gosh. thing. I don't know. <laughs> They're like, well, I can't find the softball. This cabbage will work. <laughs> 
And Court, you mentioned like the vibe at sporting events, right? Like it's kind of the same with music. People are all there to enjoy the same thing. Growing up in, you know, Northwest Florida, I would have never thought that I would be a hockey fan until I went to a game. I had so much fun at the first game that I went to that like I'm I'm a hockey fan for life now. Like it's one of those things that just completely took me by surprise. So even like sports or music or anything, like kind of step out of your comfort zone a little bit. I'm I'm down for whatever music, but I've never been to like a major pop show until we went to that Billie Eilish concert. And that's probably like in my top four or five shows that I've ever been to. That was it was a blast. Like the vibe is always good at live shows because everybody's there to have fun. It's just, it's it's so much fun because you're there for one collective thing. And I feel like concerts, concerts go so much deeper than just going to see your favorite artist. You know, like the way you feel about certain songs and hearing them live. It just, I, I feel like it's a lot deeper than just going like sit and kick back and listen to music. How about this? Courtney, why do you like music? <laughs> I like music because I think it's universal. Boom. No, honestly, I will tell you guys. So I remember hearing Baby One More Time when it was first released on the radio. And I had grown up listening to a lot of pop music. You know, my dad listened to rock. My brother listened to rap. Uh, So I, I was already listening to different genres of music. But I remember hearing that song and something in me just clicking like i love this i don't know why but i love it and it was that song and britney that made me realize and i'm like 12 13 years old but it made me realize that i could have a connection with an artist on a much deeper level than just enjoying the music that they put out So from there, I was a massive Britney fan. I hearing that and having that connection is, you know, what made me want to work in music. And then from there, because I like pop music so much, I would watch TRL every day. And I remember Avenge coming on TRL and them performing. And I was just like, okay, like, I like this. I I can get into this. So from there, you know, I checked them out. I really liked City of Evil. I went back and listened to, you know, everything that they had released before then. And again, it was just something about them that made something in me click. I was just like, okay, I've been following Britney on this level. I'm going to add these guys to this. And just a few short years later... I hear I kissed the girl on the radio and I was like, wow, this is a fantastic song. You know, it was the debut single and, and all this kind of stuff. And so Brittany avenged and Katie became my, my holy trinity of music where I just connected with these people on a different level and they were so good at what they did at least Avenged and Katie, where they're writing these songs about these experiences that they've had. I've never had these experiences, but they're so well written that it evokes an emotion in me. Like, I have experienced this. You know, these songs can make you feel happy. They can make you feel sad. They can help you through this and they can help you through that. And I wish more people had a relationship with music the way that we do. Because lots of people are just, oh yeah, you know, I enjoy music. I listen to the radio, this, this, and this. And then you go to a concert, which this has happened to me multiple times where I go to a concert, I get teary-eyed the second that it starts. Mm Mm-hmm. 100%. It's just like, and I, I, you know, I say that they're my holy trinity. I would probably have a holy quad because I did get into Billy and I didn't jump straight into that uh, right off the bat, but she absolutely has become 
you know, one of my top four and a part of that group of artists that I connect with, you know, it kind of brings it full circle back to concerts where the last show that I went to before COVID hit was Cher. I took my mom to go see her for her birthday. We went to that show a few short months later, COVID hit. And then we had nothing for two years. And at that point, you know, I always love going to concerts. Two years goes by with nothing. And then Billy announces that she's going on tour. My city is going to be the first city that she goes to. And I was like, well, I'm absolutely going to this. And I remember feeling so overcome with emotion when the lights went out and everybody started screaming and the music came on. I didn't know how much pent up emotion I had inside of me until that happened. And I spent that entire concert being happy, letting out a bunch of anger, getting teary eyed and crying just and and you know, like afterwards, I was just like, I didn't know that so much of the past two years was pent up inside of me until I could finally go to a concert and feel that again, especially with somebody that I really love. So yeah, I, I mean, I wish everybody had that kind of relationship with music because music can be so healing. It can be exactly what you need at exactly the right time, no matter your mood. And to have these relationships with artists, I feel is just something really special. You, you made me emotional just now. <laughs> I'm waiting for our experience of Avenged Sevenfold coming back on stage, man. Yeah, there's no doubt in my mind that I will get emotional when I see them live again. Mm -hmm. I'm hoping it's the first show that they do. I'm, you know, I'm really hoping that I can get to that wherever that may be. But with it being so long and hopefully being with friends and just hearing their music again in a live setting, no doubt in my mind. It's going to be all time. And so much has changed in the last year that I think just because experience wise, you know what I mean? Yeah, it's going to be, uh, it's going to be different for me because I'll actually have friends this time. <laughs> I'm not going to be there by myself. <laughs> oh, whatever. You have lots of friends. All I can think about is you have such an interesting cross. I don't know that anybody in the world has your same cross section of music <laughs> well look i <laughs> i love it though i think it, that's like that's what's cool about it that's what's cool about it you know what i mean is that everybody has their own weird little like uh you know venn diagram i guess of music and how things intersect but uh britney spears is really the outlier for me on that i don't know you know what i mean i love it though yeah, it's wild. I mean, people ask me, you know, like, how did you get into music? And I'm like, oh, well, it all started with a girl from Kentwood, Louisiana, <laughs> um, who is just on a, you know, completely different spectrum than Avenged Sevenfold is. But look, yeah. I don't care what anybody says. A lot of their music is poppy. It has a lot of pop influences in it. Mm -hmm. And they will tell you the same thing. They love pop music. Mm -hmm. I guess that just kind of played into it, even though I really do listen to a lot of different stuff. And I like it that way because I don't like being stuck listening to one genre of music. I think that's so boring. Yeah. Way boring. And I don't know I don't know what anybody gets out of that. Bored. It's kind of like <laughs> bled into this weight with Avenged where people are like I want new music to listen to. And I'm like, go listen to something yeah. else then. Like you've, you've put me are, on some good stuff here lately, Courtney. There's a multitude of artists that you can listen to. And I feel like I, I see it most with rock and metal fans where every other sort of genre is looked down upon and they mm. don't think it's that it takes as much to write a pop song as it takes to write a metal song. And I'm like, Give me an example. And they're like, well, it took five people to write this pop song. And I'm like, it took five people to write that metal rock song. There's five people in the band. Like, they all wrote it. Like, what? so what's your point? I just want to be like, please just go educate yourself. Because pop music can be very intricate to write a good pop song oh, for sure. that stands the test of time. Dude, that Teenage Dream album. You know oh, what my mean? God. Seriously. The whole album. That the whole is album. One of the best pop albums, like biased or not, that is one of the best pop albums in history. It's one of the best. I mean, it's one of the most successful albums in history. You know, like it, uh, well, yeah. So 
she got five number one singles off of that album that tied Michael Jackson for the f- the most number one singles off of one album and actually got cheated out of beating that because she re-released the album with extra tracks. One or two of those tracks went number one, so it would have beat it, but then... Mm. They were like, oh, we're going to, no, you know, re-released albums don't count. So <laughs> yeah. I was just like, oh, God. Yeah. Hey, yeah, well, hey, there you have it. Uh, do your research on pop music. Do it for our friend Court. Big thank you again, Court, for coming on the show today. I want to shout out Jake over at Dirty Burger Productions for editing this podcast. And thanks to you for listening. If you'd like to check out more of what Court has going on, visit the Avenged Sevenfold Death Bats Club Discord server. You can find Jake at Dirty Burger Boy on Twitter, and you can keep up with what we're doing at SultansOfSlack.com. 